So we are reading At the Dark End of the Street, Black Women, Rape and Resistance, A New History of the Civil Rights Movement from Rosa Parks to the Rise of Black Power by Danielle McGuire. And our sessions are, it started June 3rd and they last until July 29th. They are from 6.30 to 8. Okay. All right, we're at um, 8.4. After the arrest of Rosa Parks, Joanne Robinson, didn't wait for the approval of Edie Nixon. She and the Women's Political Council launched the bus boycott, complete with flyers promoting it as an effort to protect black womanhood. What's our question? And so, the question is, today we hear much about uh, economic disparity among men and women. However, the gap between the earning of black and white women is great as well. White women have enjoyed the benefits of the Civil Rights Bill, smashing through the glass ceiling and reaching professional and personal success. But there is still a bus to be. It's an economic one. How can African Americans move to the front of the bus today? Oh, I want to. Uh, <laughs> I want to answer that first. Um, can Can you repeat the question, please? Sure. Today we hear much about economic disparity among men and women. However, the gap between the earning of black and white women is great as well. White women have enjoyed the benefits of the Civil Rights Bill, smashing through glass ceilings and reaching professional and personal success. But there is still a bust today. It's an economic one. How can African American women move to the front of the bus today? Okay, very good question. Thank you. Well, <clears throat> for me, I guess. I, I, I'm just I'm sitting here I'm thinking about um, one of the lessons that my parents used to teach about being the best you know no matter what you did um, you know if we mopped the floor and um, um, it didn't look right you know they they uh, have you go back and do it again um, so so I think um, I think they are really two approaches to this question. One, I mean, I think I know the answer, but I think one is we need to seriously be trying to figure out how we feel about the capitalistic system. Okay. Um, and, and 
you know, do we want to be a part of it, and and does it work for us? You know, we're we're in this book focused on the 40s and 50s, where I think the consensus was well, no, they're all was um, you know division in the community, but but there was a part of the community that was moving toward integration and moving toward being a part of um, the American capitalistic structure. Um, I think we have some experience in that. Personally, I think it, we should have always been assessing um, how we were faring uh, in that process and, and deciding whether or not it's working for us. I don't think it's working for many of us very well. Um, we have our Oprah's, you know, we have our success stories, um, but I think for the mass of black people, um, um, the system has not been good to us. However, if we're not going to foment revolution and change it, then how do we be the best? How you know? How do we um, um, participate in the system and do it well? Um, and if that's the case, then I think that we have to seriously um, take our own entrepreneurial development. We have to take that path seriously. And we've done it before and we've done it well and you know we're traumatized because so much of that has been um, destroyed in the blink of an eye by white folks and you know so I understand but um, you know one of the things Rosa Parks said in this chapter that I, that I loved was you know, she had decided a long time ago she was never going to be going to any meeting with a piece of paper in her hand asking white folks to do nothing. And um, I, I think that's the right approach, really. Um, and I think that's the right approach economically that, you know, we've got to figure out how to um, create our own sub-economy, you know, not, not the illegal kind that gets us um, yeah, <laughs> in <time>. prison, <laughs> yes, but providing real, the whole plethora of services that we need as human beings. So that's my answer, Georgette. Uh, may, okay, may I, may I come in? Sure, go ahead. Okay, uh, and, and I don't I don't mean to be male male dominating, so please don't take it that way. Oh, we won't allow and that. I, 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 I figured. Uh, I don't figured worry that. about it. There, there you go. Okay, well, let me just say this briefly. Um, to to follow up on what Michelle has said, I think very good very good points. Um, you know, one we have to recognize as we operate within the system that there is a pecking order. Uh, the white man is first, the white woman is second, the black man is third and the white and the black woman is fourth or our places are interchangeable, truth, truth be told in this pecking order of things. Um, that's, that's one. Uh, number two, which is really number one, is that we have to, as a people, individually and collectively, um, hold ourselves to a higher standard of acquiring uh, an education that makes us uh, an independent people uh, as opposed to a dependent people, okay? Uh, knowledge is universal. It, it, is, it is not uh, just designated for one set or race of people. It is for all people, and we all can acquire uh, a, a high degree of education, uh, whether it is through uh, traditional channels, you know, attending the public school, private school, whatever the case may be, or going to the library. Uh, nowadays, we know we have the internet. Um, so we have many different avenues today uh, to seek out knowledge and skill on a high level. And uh, we can seek out the knowledge on various different uh, subjects or career paths. So what we want to do is we want to equip ourselves with a high level of education and a high level of capability 
that goes along with a high level of drive and self-motivation towards excellence. Then we want to partner with like-minded people so that so that when we can we can form uh, groups, organizations, we can form uh, businesses, service ser services, and so on and so forth. In the tradition of, uh, as as Michelle had mentioned, really, um, in the tradition of our foremothers and fathers, you mentioned, you know, uh, Rosa Parks in this particular case, um, and, and others, uh, Mary yeah. McLeod Bethune, I had read uh, some years ago that she started Bethune-Cookman College by selling um, uh, um, sweet potato pies. Mm -hmm. uh, she, had, she had that skill to make them, and she had the enterprise or the arch entrepreneurial spirit where she um, used those proceeds to mm -hmm. purchase some land. It so happened to be a garbage dump, so, so she got it for next to nothing, you see. Mm -hmm. But she had a, she had a vision. And the vision was to form a uh, a college that uh, would would assist black folk in acquiring an education, a higher uh, level of education that wasn't necessarily available to them at that time. You see, this was uh, this was this was uh, uh, um, uh, pre-integration, if you will, a pre-the civil rights movement, if you will. Mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. So you and I were still being banned uh, from from uh, many different colleges and universities. Uh, so this is what she did. So mm -hmm. acting in that tradition, uh, and we, we we you know we have uh, glorious examples amongst our people, men and women, our mm -hmm. women in particular, uh, of of how we can we can uh, be creative in surviving. And not only yeah, surviving, but yeah, I, I make a mean carrot cake if I must say so myself. <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> Benita, I know you had something to say. <laughs> She's still on mute. Are you on mute? Benita, are you on mute? No, I'm unmuted. Khalib, am I pronouncing your name correctly? Labib. Labib. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry, I did write that down. Um, I've sat back and I've watched a lot of things happen. I think basically what happened to black folk is the 80s. True. That's True. what happened to black folk was the 80s. You're right. When, when white folks told them that, oh, now you can move in the suburbs and now you can buy a car and now thanks to the hard work of the black woman the black men can have a white woman mm. and now you can do all this other happy stuff mm. so at that point we got very comfortable <laughs> we got very very comfortable with ourselves. I saw it all around me. Yes. You know, times were good. You thought you had a couple of dollars. No one told you, and that was the plan anyway, to tell you that things change constantly and what you have today is nothing tomorrow. That's correct. That's what happened to black folks. Then you started to get the images on television. You know, the and everyone started, you know, when when we said the individual we meant to think creatively individual. Yes. We did not mean to divide ourselves. So we divided ourselves also social economically. True. So I just don't know. I truly believe that during that time, black folks have done more damage to themselves than a white man can ever do. So I take, I, I, I think we need to start taking a whole bunch of responsibility. Yes. Racism is that much of it, but we have done more damage to ourselves than any white person did or lie could ever do to us. You're, because you're, we decided that we were going to emulate Caucasians. Yes. We decided that we were going to, oh, we make $50,000 a year, but we can buy a home that costs $400,000 a year. Now, I know Einstein, don't pretend to be. But there's a thing called simple math. <laughs> and then we turn around and we'll take responsibility for our behavior. Yes. Well, I'm sorry. 
the banks has held a magnum to our heads and made us buy this home with 85% interest rate on $40,000 a year. So I just think that unless we start living in the truth, nothing's going to happen. And I don't blame, I blame very little on the white man at this point. Yes. In spite of everything else that's going on, I blame very little at this point. We lost ourselves because we actually, for some ungodly reason, I say it as a whole, um, start to emulate their behaviors. What we forgot, though, is that they will land on their feet regardless, and we don't. Right. We didn't have the uh, foundation. Right. We didn't. We and didn't they have managed, the. Uh, and they yeah. managed to divide us. They managed. To, they managed once again to help divide us by social economics. Yeah. Yeah. And then you had, you know, all the other things that's going on. If you turn it, I don't even watch television. You know, I'm really embarrassed. We have all the reality shows on television. I don't know people like that. <laughs> we're, 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 creating, we're, we're creating our own uh, entertainment content right here. Let's hear from our young person, Randy. Randy, can you hear me? Yes, you froze up for a second. Okay. Did you ask me something? Yeah. Um. Did you have something to say about question four? Um. Well, I think Levi. He. He. I think part of his part of his answer dealt with education, and Vanita. Uh, Part of her her answer uh, dealt with personal accountability, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I do I do believe that education is the highest form of resistance against white supremacy, against internalized racism. I think that it is key. Um, I really do. I really do believe it. It's, it's a shame that a lot of people, a lot of black people, who can't afford to go to school. Um, what people don't want us to know, there are so many scholarships out there um, for everybody. And we don't we don't apply for them because we don't think that we can go. And a lot I, I know a lot of people I grew up with didn't believe that they were worthy of going to school, or that it would do anything for them. And I think that that is that is something that we were we have been taught to believe. And I just don't think it's true. In terms of personal accountability, I mentioned this to Michelle um, before, but I, I did my senior project for college on internalized racism. I looked at how the late 1800s to 1930s and lynchings that took place during that period and how those lynchings provoked internalized racism in black Americans. I think that at the root of our problem is that black people have started to internalize a lot of the messages that we have been, that we, that has been like spewed at us from that time period of, of extreme lynching, which is, which is a, which lynchings to me were, as I argue, were a blatant example of rejection. They, you know, you, you, you couldn't touch white women. They were forbidden fruit. Can a black man really be a man if he can't if he can't be with a white woman? All of this wrapped up in it, and of course, the the rapings of black women that were gone uncontested and unindicted. And I think that we, over time, have internalized. There's no reason in voting. There's no point in speaking up. My skin is too dark because those are messages that we have been fed. And and when you are traumatized. You, you know, what goes first, physical, emotional, mental, people want to forget. People don't want to talk about it. And like Michelle said earlier, when you find yourself asserting your humanity, you realize that people are turned off because we don't do that anymore. And so and I think that internalized racism and lack of education is a, is a big part of why black people, or why we are who we are. And, you know, black people, like you mentioned earlier, I think many of you said as well, and another question, we were always taught whatever happens in this house stays in this house. And all that doesn't just include, you know, mom and daddy fighting. That's incest, that's sexual assault, that's that's domestic violence, that's an alcoholic parent. And black people, majority don't believe in psychology, don't believe in going to see a therapist. So we got all this mental trauma and emotional trauma that we're holding on to and nobody's talking about it and healing from it. And so you got all of that piled up on top of the fact that we really haven't, it's gotten better, but I think that it stayed the same. I think a lot of things 
it looks different, but it's the same thing. We don't just have racism anymore. We have institutionalized racism. We have racism on Ivy League campuses and private schools. And I think all that combined is why we are struggling. I try to stay away from blaming black people because I, I have to step back and, and recognize at one point I was broken and very uneducated and did not love myself and had internalized images of whiteness that I thought were right. And that does affect the mind and that does affect who you are as a person, who you are as a person to your people. And a lot of people, I don't think a lot of black people have really sat down and thought about that or want to. Very, very good points. I didn't, I didn't catch your name. Randy. Randy. How you doing, Randy? Very good points. Um, I recently heard uh, Tony Morrison, uh, a, a clip from Tony Morrison uh, talking with uh, uh, Charlie Rose on on the Charlie Rose uh, program. Uh, he asked her about racism, and she she pulled what I call a, a James Baldwin on the questioner and what she did was beautiful she said that uh racism you know is not a black person's problem because it is not a black person's invention it is a white person's problem because it is a white person's uh invention so white folks need to start asking themselves what purpose does racism or white supremacy serve you? And how would you be as a human being without racism, with, with, without the institution of racism, without the institution of white supremacy? Would you be a kind person? Would you be a respectful person? Uh, would you be an intelligent person? Um, you know, would you be a good human being? Um, so that's the question that has to be posed to white folks, and white folks have to delve within themselves and be real with themselves. Uh, as black people on the receiving end of racism, we're not the victims. And that is just what is so hard for them to do. Let me just say it is 8 o'clock now. Um, I'm willing to go another 10 or 15 minutes if you all are because we did start late tonight. How does everybody feel about that? That's fine. I, I, I'll hang out. Okay. So, um, you, you know, Labib, as you were telling that um, story about Toni Morrison, yes. I was thinking about um, a post I, I posted. I, I do a lot, not all of it, but I do a lot of the social media for Black Women's Blueprint. So I posted um, the same picture I had posted on my personal Facebook wall, which is of a large black woman with her breast out um, nursing a white baby mm -hmm. and another black woman holding um, a little white baby. And, um, and it, it sparked a lot of conversation on the Black Women's Blueprint Facebook page, especially after a white person showed up to um, try to say to us, um, you know, what's your point in showing this? And, um, um, and it, you know, it was one of those obstinate, ignorant type white folk that you just couldn't, um, you couldn't reason with no matter what. Um, but, but so often that is the case. Rather than, than, than looking at the reality of our history, um, people are trying yes. so hard that to protect themselves. Something yesterday, a quote by Betty, uh, Betty Chavez that says, um, you know, most people can't deal with reality. Something like that. But it's true. It's true. And so, and that's whether you're black or white. Uh, most people are not trying to look at the gruesomeness of our history or our current 
situation. I mean, people on the, in the Facebook correct. people in the Facebook uh, group were trying to make the point to this white person that look, we you know we got people on Park Avenue nursing little white babies. Wait, you talking this about history? True. We talked about just like Vanita said about Connecticut. We talked about what happened today. Yes, but they don't want to look at it because it means risking their own privilege, and that's what it comes down to. Correct. Right. Jay, we haven't heard from. Go, go ahead. No, no, no. Go oh, ahead. You, you quite touched it. <laughs> touched it all. Very powerful statements. Yeah. Yeah. Just a second, if you don't mind. Randy, I don't want you to think by any means when I made the statement that you have to have self-respect. I did not, and I don't want you to, I have two children, my sons, myself, which are adult mm -hmm. sons, but I don't want you to think that for a minute I was saying, let's keep anything in the closet. The problem is with black folk, we keep too much in the closet. Oh. However, you know what I'm saying? I don't, want you to, I don't want you to think that that's what I was actually saying, because by no means we have a lot of issues, and that's the problem is that we don't live in the truth. You know, when I take responsibility, I'm not. I, I don't want you to think I'm. I don't also want you to think I'm blaming us. However, you got to clean your own backyard up first. That's correct. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. I cannot honestly sit here with two black educated sons. That my husband worked tirelessly. And I stayed home for 20 something years to raise, to be the men they are today, and say that a white man stopped me. Mm. He didn't. He didn't stop me. He didn't stop me from making sure that my children, the school system, gave them what they needed so they'd be prepared for higher education. He didn't stop me from doing that. Right. He didn't stop me from seeking out the information I need to be the best mother and my husband. Yes, surprisingly, there are some two family black homes left in America, like a whole lot. <laughs> he didn't stop me from doing that. Well, you know, so that's, 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 that's what I mean. Personal responsibility. You got to clean up your own backyard first before you can start looking out there at other folks and, and what injustices you feel that they're doing to you. I mean, you can't Benita get... and I have this argument kind of all the time. Um, and, and I would just just say to that, um, you know, Vanita's uh, highly intelligent and resourceful person, and she sometimes loses sight of the fact that um, not everyone is. And that's not to say she was born with a silver spoon in her mouth. She wasn't. Uh, but she was born with a, a higher than average level of intelligence and resourcefulness. And we have to remember that people are individuals. Um, they come with individual um, gifts and burdens and they cope uh, differently with the reality of their circumstances. And so where one person may be able to pull themselves up by bootstraps that they do not have, um, someone else uh, will, will not be able to, to take on that fight. So, you know, I, I just, I, I think we have to, um, to, to leave room for compassion. And I do. I do leave room for compassion, but I don't like to have a pocket full of excuses. I'm, I'm, I, I, you know what I'm saying? I, you know, we all can contribute something. I, 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 let me back up, uh, Anita, for, for a minute uh, and say this, that um, she's right. Because at the end of the day, what do we want and what do we need in terms of our survival is that we need success. We need a successful accomplishment of our ultimate goal. One is to have life tomorrow and to have a quality of life tomorrow. So whether uh, anybody else cooperates with us in this goal, we have to take the onus 
on ourselves to make sure that we do any and everything that is necessary to accomplish that goal, the survival of our people and uh, a quality existence into tomorrow. So in that regard, we have to be leaders. And, and what, are, what are leaders, what's the mindset of a leader? Leader says, look, the buck stops here. We, 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 we fail, it's on my head. We succeed, it's, it's, on, it's, it's on, our, on our head. That's, that's the mindset of a leader. So I, I agree with, uh, with, with Anita. We kind of have to narrow down or pare down um, our, our uh, legitimate even, excuse, you know, excuses. We, we, we have to. Um, it's, it's just it's, it's an onus that we have to, we have to bear. The Chinese yeah, are not no, going to come. I, I agree with that. I agree with that.